Gavinoxious, I think I got that right, Gavinoxious G says, do you consider hackers a part of the makers community? A lot of hackerspaces go by makerspaces now. Of course I do. Hacking is totally making. Um, to be fair, white hat hacking. I, I, yeah, let's, let's be really clear. Uh, I, like, yeah. But, I mean, ha the hacker ethos, which comes out of MIT in the 50s, comes from a group of people wanting to go look at things that might have been locked behind, uh, locked away from their view, and their goal was to see things and then leave what they saw exactly as they found it. That is an absolutely a maker ethos. Uh, actually, a guy came up to me. There were a lot of tears in the, in, there have been a lot of tears in the autograph lines um, over the last four cons. And on Sunday in, in Portland, a guy came up early on and he said, uh, he asked me to sign a copy of my book. And in the first chapter of my book, I talk about coding being making because somebody came up to me at Maker Faire in San Mateo and said, I don't make stuff, I'm a coder. And I yelled, coding is making! Uh, and I tell that story in the book. And this guy came up and he said, he wa what he wanted to say was, that really affected me when you said that coding is making, but he didn't get it out because just saying the words made him choke up. Um, and that's, that's how I'm, that's how much impact we can have when we are not gatekeeping, when we're not testing people for their worthiness of their opinions for the things that we love, when we are not saying your experience isn't valid because you haven't gone through the same thing I have. When we are inclusive, we can change the lives of people without even knowing it. This guy read that coding is making and telling me about it two years after my book came out got him choked up. That's a really powerful experience, and I am sorry that that person spent so long thinking that somehow their work was less than because it fell into some other category that somebody thought wasn't making. I'm really glad that no one shits on 3D printing anymore, or at least I haven't been seeing it in a long time. Because um, for a long time, there were people in the cosplay community saying that 3D printing was cheating, and anybody who's ever printed something and then tried to make it look great knows that they're, there's cheat. No, there's no cheating, man. You still got to do the labor. It's real. Um, yeah, hackers are makers. Uh, mm. Joanna Ellsworth asks this great question. I work in education, she says, with a lot of STEM STEAM focused students at a space museum, and some of them tend to become frustrated when we encourage them to be creative with their solutions to science or engineering problems. And then she asks, how important is creativity when it comes to your builds or busting myths? What do you do when you have a problem that can't be solved immediately? What is the weirdest, most creative solution to a problem you are proudest of? Those are all really, really big questions, but I'd like to talk about the biggest question you're you're asking, which is, um, right, so you say I work with a lot of STEM students and I say STEAM because I add the A, but for arts, um, some of them become frustrated when we encourage them to be creative with their solutions. So I'm guessing that part of that frustration might be to them the idea of creativity as a disconnect within a scientific frame and the most beautiful and amazing thing I learned from 13 years of doing Mythbusters is that science is an absolutely, deeply creative discipline. Uh, and it is in the first step of the scientific method, form a hypothesis. Well, I guess there's a question is the first step, and then to answer the question, you form a hypothesis. Forming a hypothesis is a creative act. Where does that hypothesis come from? You might think that your hypothesis is low-hanging fruit, but low-hanging fruit to you might not be to somebody else. Um, Robert Piercing 
This isn't my revelation either. This comes from Robert Piercing from Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. And it changed my life when he said in that book, the scientific method is a deeply creative process. Moreover, in the same way that the more explorations you do creatively, the more you can do creatively, like they are self-generating, so are hypotheses. The more hypotheses you come up with, the more you can come up with. The weirder you go, the more strange things occur to you, and a lot of solutions come about because of people getting as weird as they possibly can and then chasing these things down to their natural conclusions. Um, so creativity isn't just important, it's intrinsic. So the thing maybe to understand is, again, when you're saying to a kid that's in a science program, be creative, it, I can imagine that they might, coming from the specific frame they're coming from, might imagine that you're asking them to do something outside of the purview of what they've expected. And the trick for us is to help everybody understand that creativity is intrinsic to this process, not not an adjunct, not ancillary, not an add-on. It is, it, is, it is deeply embedded in that process. Um, the only way you come up with solutions to difficult problems is by thinking creatively about the future and positing alternate futures. That's creativity right there. Jamie loves to point out that for us building the lead balloon was us figuring out all the ways to keep this material from failing. And f in order to do that, we had to think about all the ways in which it was gonna fail. And then we had to run them off at the pass. And the way Jamie described it, and I love this is, he said it's the closest that I've ever been to looking into the future. Because we did encounter every single problem we posited and we had a workaround for every single one and then we got the balloon to float. That is looking into the future and that's doing it I mean, I'm using the same part of my brain that Robert Heinlein was using when he writes science fiction, um, that Neil Stevenson is using when he writes one of his books. This is, we are positing imagined, imagined realities and then we're comparing and adjusting ours to fit it or to, to help us understand the present. The weirdest, most creative solution to a problem that I am proudest of. Um, right now, I am totally ecstatic that my Iron Man Mark I was painted with chrome magic markers. <laughs> that's thrilling to me. And that's a little bit of a, uh, I, I'm making a little bit of a cheat. I use the Molotov mark markers that you can get on Amazon. I buy their refills and then I thin them with lacquer thinner and airbrush them and they spread just magnificently. But ultimately, like I never, if you told 10 year old me one day, you'll make a suit of armor that looks like it weighs hundreds of pounds and it's gonna be colored with magic markers. I would have been surprised. Um, all right. How, James Morgan wants to know, how is your sword idea coming and would you have any interest in learning historical European martial arts, otherwise known as HEMA? Um, my sword idea proceeds. I have purchased a blank uh, and the blank has been um, correctly hardened uh, and it is mostly shaped. So now it requires me to do the fine grinding on it and then to make the jewelry for it, the cross guard, the hilt and the pommel and the, the scabbard. Um, it's a beautiful blade. It's, it's a, so I found somebody who uh, takes water cut or laser cut steel blades uh, made out of uh, excellent steel and then hardens them. They sell them in different, you can buy them as just blanks or you can buy them as shaped blanks. Um, I think that I can provide a link that we can include uh, when we put this up. Um, it's a lovely piece. I'm not gonna show it to you yet because that's gonna be part of a set of videos, but I am very excited about a functional steel blade uh, that fits, like I found exactly the shape of blade that I wanted. Uh, and now that it's the correct type of steel grinding, it's gonna be a, a, a long process. And I am just starting to think about, about how its jewelry shapes up, but I'm psyched. Thank you for asking. I'm glad you're paying attention. Um, mm. Let's see here. Uh, Eric Meyer wants to know, have you read, have I read the second and third installments in the Three Body Problem series? These are three unbelievable science fiction novels by uh, 
Liu Xi... <laughs> I'm sorry, Xi Xian Lu. I'm so sorry about my butchering of his, his name. His books are incredible, absolutely beautiful books. Um, I did read the second and the third book and I loved them immensely. Um, I, did a, I did a bunch of both reading and listening to them. Uh, I was traveling a ton uh, while I was moving through the second one. So I did, I listened to that one uh, most, that was the book I listened to the most of. And it's like an 18 hour book or something like that. Um, uh, and the third one, the first and third, I, I mostly read, but I think they're magnificent. The, the construction of the Sofon, the wall facers, amazing. The, 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 the finale of the second book was so surprising to me. And I was so surprised that I could be surprised. But that was the whole point of it, is that it had to be a surprise to absolutely everyone except that character who came up with the solution. I'm trying to tell you this in ways that don't include any spoilers. Um, but yeah, the, the way the second book ends is wonderfully beautiful. And you're right, the scale of the third book is just so out of proportion and incredible. I, I, I dug all three. All three books have pieces about science fiction that I had not encountered before. Um, not to say that my reading within the canon of science fiction is incredibly deep. Um, I have huge blank spots in my reading list, but uh, so many concepts in those books that are thrilling to sort of sit and imagine. Um, I loved them. Also, uh, Ball Lightning, which is a sort of fourth tangential book. Ball Lightning is also <laughs> phenomenal. Uh, every time one of his books comes out in translation, I'm just, I'm buying it, I'm reading it, I'm loving it.